Start recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on Twitch. No engine, no library, just our only our wits to guide us, really. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that can be a problem, because some days you're just not smart enough. You're just not. And uh, you know what? That's okay, uh, because at the end of the day, programming is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, and so you just have to keep at it, and eventually you'll get where you're going. That's my motto, anyway. And today we are uh, totally keeping at it. Um, we're working on some Z stuff that we've been working on for a couple days. Um, and of course, it wasn't really a problem of us not being smart enough. It was a problem of just us having a bunch of things that we wanted to figure out. And so we're kind of going through and figuring out uh, how we want to handle uh, everything in terms of layers in the game. And so we kind of opened up a bunch of things yesterday because uh, there's a, there's, we sort of have this little thing now where we can walk up and down levels and kind of a little imaginary uh, stairwell thing. And it kind of opened up a bunch of things that we need to go take care of to get Z handling uh, totally solid in the game. And that was really one of the big unknown pieces in terms of engine architecture. Uh, and it's not really a, necessarily about the architecture per se, meaning it's not really about uh, necessarily how the components uh, that are running the game fit together, but it is sort of about this the underlying language of the game, right? Like how it treats Z and how the different components look at Z and use Z uh, is something that we don't want to leave in the air for very long, right? We want to get that nailed down before we start writing any game code, certainly, because we don't want to be in this situation where we get halfway through the game and realize our Z is totally uh, wrong. So we want to uh, be able to sort of know that we've done a good exploratory job and have a reasonably good opinion about how our Z is going to work uh, before we kind of push through that. So before I get started, let me just remind everyone it is day 108. That means if you have pre-ordered the game on handmadehero.org and you want to follow along at home with the source code exactly as I am doing it, uh, you will need to unzip day 107 source code. Uh, so go ahead and unzip that into a directory, and that is all you would need to follow along uh, with what I'm doing. Well, uh, and of course, the free version of, of Visual Studio uh, Community Edition or whatever. But uh, let's go ahead and take a look at where we're at, right? Uh, and let's talk about some of the things that we need to do to get us uh, to where we want to be. Uh, so we set up some interesting stuff here. Uh, basically, what we did is we said, well, we're not going to draw any ground. We're just going to draw the trees for now because uh, that if the ground were there, it would obscure the different levels. And we actually have uh, several levels now uh, stacked on top of each other. And we drew these little, we don't actually have a bitmap for stairwells yet, which is a little bit of a mistake on our part. Uh, but what are you going to do? Um, so we drew these little yellow uh, rectangles in there and we can use them. We can actually use them to walk uh, down multiple levels. Right, so I can I can keep going up to the top of the stairwell and then walking down it, uh, and you can kind of see that as I do that we we descend, right? And if I want to walk upwards, uh, we uh, ascend to the next level, right? Like so, and you can also see that we're doing uh, some fading in and out there. You can see as the trees come in, they fade. Uh, but what you'll notice, and the thing that I kind of left off with yesterday, which I think might be a good thing uh, to fix today. Uh, at the start is you'll notice that we're not like the the actual Z motion of things is not correct like uh, if you if you've ever just looked even in the real world uh, you'll know that as things if things are moving towards you or moving away from you they appear to be moving faster as they get closer to you not as they get further away uh, but as you can see from the way it's working here, that's, that's not what's going on, right? Things in the distance are actually moving faster towards us uh, than things in the front. And that's because we haven't done anything uh, to try and do per, uh, proper uh, perspective to make our game actually have uh, that real 3D movement feel in Z. And even though we're not a 3D game, we are handling a bunch of Z as if we are a 3D game and we just, our art happens to be 2D. And so what we want to do is we want to get the math right there uh, so that it will look as good as it can look because it won't affect our performance really uh, to do the correct Z calculation. So if we go ahead and do all the optimization on our renderer to handle all the scaling and stuff like we're planning to do, I mean, we already wrote the simple version, but when we do the optimized version for doing all that work to support scaling and stuff, we want to make sure we don't uh, lose all of the goodness that we get from that by having a stupid function that, that calculates the scaling at the head end, which is the cheap part, right? So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about how that works, and then we'll go ahead and try to set up something uh, where we can um, compute what those values should be in a more correct way. 
so let's take a look. Let's go over to the Blackboard here uh, and take a look at that so I can kind of try to explain a little bit about how 3D transforms work um, uh, without going into too much detail on stuff that we don't care about because we're 2D, uh, but while still kind of hoping to give you a, a full enough picture that you understand how it works in general. Okay. Now, I'm going to draw both the traditional diagram and a little extension of the traditional diagram just to set you up for success should you ever try to step past a 2D game into a 3D game and want to kind of understand uh, what's going on. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, I, uh, <clears throat> I want you to imagine, if you will, uh, your monitor, right? You've got, uh, you've got a monitor, right? Uh, and I'm going to draw this. This is the screen here. Uh, and you are back here somewhere, right? Uh, and you are looking at the monitor, okay? And if, you know, this is where you are, this is your eye, and your, you know, there's your eyelashes, lovely. And you're looking at this screen, right? Uh, you can kind of imagine that what you want to have happen is you want the screen to behave almost as if it were a window into a three-dimensional world that were behind it, right? And what we want to do is we want to draw things on this screen at the locations where they would appear, right? Uh, if they were to be flattened onto the screen based on where your eye was actually seeing them, if they were out here, right? So if I have, you know, some kind of a cube that's out here, right, that I'm trying to draw, like so, uh, then you can imagine drawing a line out to each of the points of the cube, like so, right? And seeing where that line intersects uh, the monitor, right? And then if you drew the cube with those points, that would give you uh, the perspective version of the cube, right? Because if you think about it, no matter where we sort of take a plane in the world, if we were to take all of that incoming light, right? You can imagine this is light that's coming into your eye or something like that. If we were to just capture all the light that was passing through that plane, uh, and found all of it that was headed for your eye, that would give us, right, that complete picture, okay? Um, and so if you think about looking how this looks from the side, right, here's the monitor. So I'm taking this, this piece here. There's the monitor, right? Uh, here's the eyeball. Uh, and here's my cube, right? So here is that line that I'm drawing, right? down to the, that, that iris. And you can actually see here where it would intersect, right? And what I want you to notice is that these points, this cube is totally aligned, right, with the horizontal. And if we wanted to project it straight across both this point and this point, let's say this is point A and this is point B, these two points would actually be projected to the exact same place, right? They'd be projected to like there. But if we were going to do this sort of perspective projection, and that, by the way, is orthographic. That's what they call an orthographic projection. An ortho orthographic projection, um, oops, didn't mean to put an S on the end of that. An orthographic projection is one where points project in straight parallel lines onto uh, that, the, the imaginary display surface there, right, that we're pretending is the monitor. Um, but if we actually use perspective lines, right, you can see that, oops, I didn't draw that very well. Really need some kind of a 3D imaging, like one of those little construction programs. If we were to do these lines in perspective so that they all converge at the eye point, right? Then you'll notice that the same points that were at the same level, which would have been projected to the same point if we were orthographic, in perspective, right, which is what this kind of projection is, in perspective, they actually appear sort of shrunk down, right? You can, you can sort of imagine uh, if I was to take like the other one here, right? The back part of the cube, even though it's exactly the same size as the front part, that back part projects onto a much smaller plate, um, a much smaller area, right? It's only that big, whereas the same size object projects onto that big. And so what we get here is this is, is you know, what they often call, you know, foreshortening, right? or just perspective. You see terms thrown around for it, not necessarily in technical sense, but in, a, in an artistic sense even, right? Uh, but that's what's going on there, right? The shrinking is because we are trying to project things as if we were capturing the light that's heading to your eye. Now, it's not quite as simple as that. I will briefly mention the more complex diagram uh, that's actually a little more accurate. 
This is the simplistic one that we're going to use and that most uh, books use for th explaining 3D. So we'll stick with it so you can uh, follow along with, with those kinds of explanations. There's actually a, a slightly more complete explanation, um, which is that in optics, uh, when you're actually talking about capturing light, uh, it doesn't really work this way. What actually happens, right, is you've got a lens assembly, right? And I'll sort of idealize that lens assembly by drawing uh, just a single lens, right? But you imagine like a camera or your eye or something like that, right? Uh, what actually happens, and I apologize, in fact, turn off your brain and don't listen to this right now if you're afraid of being confused by stuff that doesn't apply to today's lesson because this is entirely optional. Everything that I'm saying uh, from, from here until when I tell you to turn the brain back on, okay? But for people who just want to know, uh, this is how things actually work. Um, so in the real world, it's not quite as simple as that. What actually happens is there are lenses, either your eyeball or a camera lens, something like that, and light that is coming in uh, to the lens, uh, like so, right? Light that is coming into the lens hits the lens and gets refracted right, which is the term we use to describe what happens to light when it passes through something which does not absorb it but only changes its direction, right. Uh, it gets refracted and focused down to a point, okay. That point is called the focal point. It is behind the lens somewhere and you can see it's kind of similar to this drawing we drew over here. But what then happens is the light continues um, right? Because it's just focusing to a point and then continuing through. There's nothing to, to gather the light there. And then in the back, we actually have something that gathers it, right? Either it would be your retina, right? Um, in, if, if this was your eyeball, right? Or it would be like the image plane or the film back in a camera, let's say, right? The actual thing that you're trying to expose the light to, right? Or the sensor in a digital camera, okay? Um, and the reason that this diagram is relatively important to understand if you want to understand more advanced imaging techniques um, is that if you look at what happens here, it is not the case that a point in the real world is only sending light in one direction to a pixel on the screen, right? What's actually happening is a cone of light that is the radius of the lens uh, big at the lens and which focuses down to a single point at the point where you're talking about the, uh, the light reflecting, right? So photons are coming in here, right? Photons are hitting some surface. Let's imagine this is some surface here, whatever it is, this is the wall. Photons are coming in from all directions. Remember when we talked about lighting, photons are coming in from all directions, they're hitting this and they're bouncing out, right? All of the photons that bounce out within this cone will all hit the lens and will all project to points on, uh, back on this, uh, on this image plane, right? And it's kind of hard to draw a single diagram uh, which actually captures how that will work because I can't show you, it's, it's a very multi-dimensional problem. There's where the point is, uh, depend, d determine sort of where it projects onto the film back and the cone, right, you imagine is, is not actually focusing quite to a point, it's actually doing sort of this sort of a thing back here, right? There's, there's sort of this, uh, this, this different sort of process happening with all the light that happens. Um, so it's actually kind of confusing uh, to think about exactly how this actually works. If I was to draw one perhaps a little bit more accurately for an image, it would look something, I don't know if this supports that well. It would look something, um, probably erase the part back here as well. Okay, there we go. Uh, it would look something like, okay, I've got this back here. This is my actual image, right? And at each point on the image, right, uh, I'm going to end up with all of the light that could have hit this point, right, that passed through this lens. Uh, and the part that I'm trying to get to, which is really hard to draw this diagram, I, this is probably why computer graphics books don't go into this kind of detail until you get to physically based rendering. Um, but basically the point that I was trying to get to uh, so far is that what happens here, right, is that when this light uh, passes out and to hit the lens, right, and it gets refracted, well, it depends where this point is, 
where it's going to actually uh, capture the light from, right? And so you have to imagine like all of the rays that are going to hit that point from the lens all get projected down uh, and hit a specific point out in the real world uh, like so, okay? I tried to draw this as accurate as I can. I don't know if I did a very good job, but so here's a point uh, on the image plane. Here is a point in the world, uh, and there is our wall. I'll move a wall up so it can hit it there, right? And so what you can see is the actual light that's passing through uh, the lens here is actually much, uh, it, there's actually more light uh, coming than just a single ray that hits directly. It's a whole family of rays that are in a cone, right? And what this means is the bigger the lens uh, size, like the bigger the actual physical size of the lens is, the more actual light from surfaces it's capturing. And actually the wider the angle of stuff coming off of the surface is, right? Uh, hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, so what happens in this process is you're not just talking about single points projected single points. First you have that cone, right? Which hopefully I've illustrated here to some degree. Uh, and then you also have uh, what's often called bokeh or depth of field which is that you have to remember what would happen if there wasn't a wall right here where these things converge, right? Suppose the wall actually was back where I originally drew the wall, right? Uh, so here's my wall. So the points all converge here. Then what happens is they fan out again, right? And so now, not only am I capturing light from a cone, from a point, right? All of the photons passing through there that come out of here but the actual area in the world that is contributing light to that point is not infinitesimal. It's large, right? And the further back the wall is from this point, the more of those uh, photons, the, the bigger the area is that I would sort of be capturing. And this is called like the focus point, right? This is, this is actually where you're focusing, right? That's the focus of the camera. So anything that's right in here will be nice and crisp but everything that's outside, or if I was to move it closer, again, look at that area. It's taking a whole area and projecting it onto one point, right? So everything that's nearby to this appears to be in focus because all of the points in the cone that are focused on the lens are actually coming from a single point, but as you move away in either direction, you get blurrier. And that's where you get depth of field from, right? So there's one more part of this equation, okay? Uh, which is that how wide this is, is actually not only determined by the lens assembly. It's also determined by something called the aperture. And the aperture is a synthetic device uh, that has nothing to do with the lens, it's just in there. And what it does is it closes to a certain size, thus clipping off part of the rays so that they can't get through, right? This is what you set when you set something like an f-stop on your camera, okay? Uh, and as you can see, if you were to set the aperture to a wider size, you will get, so if the f-stop is wider, right, which corresponds to lower values of f-stop, the way that they do f-stop numbers, I won't go into, because that's, if you're, we're not doing any of this on the stream, like I said, you can, don't have to worry about it, but I just thought I'd give you some insight into how physical rendering works if you're actually doing, say, a ray tracer or something. Um, I actually simulate some of this in the game that I'm doing in, on, for my day job. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, so if you set this f-stop uh, to a lower number, it means it's wider. So there's more, it's like, it's, it's a, it might let this whole cone in, right? Uh, but if you set it uh, to a narrower setting, right, then it's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be a higher f-stop number, right? So for example, if you have a lens uh, that's got an f-stop of two, you know, set to two, uh, that's going to be very wide and uh, taking a, a pretty large cone. If you set your camera's f-stop to 14, it's gonna be very narrow. And what you can see, if you imagine what happens there, as this gets narrower and narrower, the cone collapses down to something that is very close to a line. What happens? Less light, more depth of field, right? Or I should say, uh, more things in focus, right? Because as you cut that down, the apparent area, like imagine if I was to cut out, right? Like let's take just this area here, right? So we have that focus point. Here's the focus point. 
and we've got all these lines passing through it, right? Well, you can kind of see that if I was to allow, um, right, if I'm to allow that whole cone through, uh, then I'm talking about the focus diverging very quickly out here. But if I was to say only be letting in ones that were very narrow cone, you can see that I have a lot further to go before I widen out to the same amount, right? And so setting that f-stop number higher reduces the amount of light, thereby making it more difficult to capture, say, nighttime imagery, but giving you a wider focus range so that you can have more things in focus at the same time, right? So uh, I hope that makes some sense to you. This is what's actually happening. And what we're doing in, in the simplification, which now you're going to have to turn your brain back on uh, very shortly. So warm up here. Get ready to turn your brain back on. It's time, OK? Um, so the simplification that we use uh, when we're not trying to simulate these effects, like if we don't care about bokeh, if we don't care about lens aberration, which is stuff that happens because this is not a perfect conical thing, if we don't care about, like, just to give you some examples of crazy stuff you can do if you're doing photo photorealistic rendering, you can simulate light bounce inside the camera. So for example, there's camera walls here. As this comes in, some of the stuff will get deflected up here, but then that will bounce out and get deflected like back onto the film back eventually. So really, really bright light sources can, can cause light bounce, which will wash out the image. There's all kinds of things like this. In fact, uh, you may have noticed, uh, I'll give you one more thing uh, before you turn your brain back on. You may have noticed that you, you ever see the, these, um, these, these uh, bros out there at the sporting events uh, for like ESPN and stuff, and they've got a camera that is like effing absurd. It looks like something like this, you know, and like it goes all the way back and the camera's like this little thing, right? And it's got this huge, gigantic thing on it that's like a giant uh, shotgun thing, right? So then at the end of that, there's like this huge hood on it. I mean, this is like what the camera looks like, right? It's a giant phallus. It's a giant thing, right? Uh, and what you'll notice is there's two parts of that lens assembly, right? One of it is the lens assembly that's actually just used for getting that really long, it, long range, which I won't talk about how the lens assembly works, but you want a, you want a sort of a bigger lens assembly if you're trying to, to shoot things that are far away. We'll, we'll ignore that part for now. Uh, but you'll notice there's this big hood on the front. And it has nothing to do with the lens. It's just a thing you like screw onto the lens. And you've seen it on cameras too, even on personal cameras like a DLSR, a DSLR camera, right? Uh, that's, that's reasonable, something that kind of looks, uh, you know, like this sort of a thing, just a regular camera. You see it, it, it you put on a thing, right? Uh, that looks kind of like that. It's like this little four-sided hat thing that goes on the camera, right? And you're like, what, you know, what is that thing? Why is that on there? And the answer is because Again, light coming into the lens will bounce around in here and it will hit the film back. It, it all will. All the photons that come in here are going to hit something and they get absorbed by something. And there's a hole in here where they can pass through, bounce around, and hit. Now, for light that's pretty weak, it doesn't matter because so few photons will actually get through and hit this thing that you don't care. But when you're shooting in, say, bright sunlight, which is when they tell you to put this thing on, there's so many photons entering the lens that if the sun was like up here and you have a ton of photons that would be coming in off angle, they would bounce around in here and wash out your image. You'd, you'd get collection on the film back. So what they do is they put in a hood right here like that, right? To block out those errant ones and only capture light that's coming in directional from the way that the camera is facing, right? Now you may ask, why is it shaped like this? right? Why is it shaped uh, in sort of this, this, this way where there's only like four pieces to it, whereas this one's shaped like that, right? And the answer to that is a little more confusing, but it basically boils down to the shape of the sensor in the back. Uh, you don't really need a sphere, you don't need a cylindrical hood uh, because typically the actual film back itself cuts out some of the bounce because it's not the, you know, the lens is, is uh, circular, but the film back is rectangular, right? Um, and so you're setting up these, these sort of blockers, right, to, to block specifically where the film back is going to actually be, right? And so you need heavy blockers on the top and the bottom because that's where it's lined up. The, the circle, right, um, let me see if I can, I can't really say anything too useful here. All right. So you have a circle, right? 
and the circle looks something like this. It's overlaid. I'm not doing a very good idea, job of this, right? I have a circle that looks like this, right? And then I have a, well, it's probably more like this. So I have a circle that looks like this, right? You can see that right here, 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 and here, right? Um, you actually don't have all of this extra lens stuff, right? Capturing more photons uh, than should even be coming in where the actual uh, sensor can collect them, right? We're not even looking at this part of the image te technically. It should never uh, contribute. But the lens is a circle and the film back is a rectangle. So you don't need, you need blockers on the top, the sides and the bottom, but right at the corners, you don't need as much because you don't have as much of the lens contributing extra photons uh, into the image as you do here. So the actual shape of this hood can be, you know, notched. When they have to do the longer hoods because you're trying to really narrow down that barrel because you've got a really big lens back here um, that's collecting a ton of light, right? Uh, then they just do a circular hood, I think, because it would just be stupid to try and notch this in at all. But I don't really know. I'm not sure what their, their rationale is for not keeping this size. I think it just turns to, it, it tends to just be easier to deal with like this uh, structurally. But anyway, that's our little tour into photorealism. Again, you don't have to know a single piece of this uh, to do Handmade Hero. We will do absolutely none of this, really. Um, but I just thought I'd give you the background so that, uh, you know, I only learned this way, and it was really annoying because I couldn't understand, like, all these techniques until I learned the other way. And so I just wanted to give you a, a way to think about it. And it also makes your camera make sense, right? You can understand how your camera works entirely uh, just by knowing, uh, getting familiar with this diagram, right? Whereas this will tell you nothing about how your camera works. You have no idea how the camera works, right? So anyway, back to this. Uh, so we understand how this works. We're all good. The approximation we want to use is one where we don't have any focus effects. We're just going to pretend that everything's in focus all the time. So wherever something is, we just trace it back uh, to a single pinhole point, basically. And if you want to think of this as a camera, instead of thinking of this as a monitor out here uh, that we're, we're uh, figuring out where the points are, you could almost think of the film back as being back here, and we're just figuring out where things on the film back actually are. The reason why it's a little bit weird to do that is because, obviously, as you can see, what happens to the light here is it flips around when it gets back here. So you actually produce a negative image on a camera. And by the way, that's actually what happens. Cameras flip the images that they have, or you might think of the film as being loaded upside down uh, and reversed or whatever, right? A mirrored film, if you will. Um, that is actually what happens. Uh, I guess mirrored is the wrong term. Just flip, just completely flipped, right? Um, however you want to, however you want to do that. I, I try not to use the word mirror because it, I don't know, it's hard to explain. It's hard, it, that means like negating one axis, which is not necessarily what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that it, it, it totally inverts itself on both axes, right? It negatives and negatives, right? Okay, ignore that, ignore that. Again, not important. Uh, so what we want to do, right, is we want to figure out how we can compute, say, where this thing should be on the monitor. Or if we want to do film back, where it is on the film back. They're actually both the same equation for the most part, so we should figure out uh, how to do it. How do we do that? Well, this turns out to be a very easy diagram uh, to construct and solve, right? It's very, very simple. If we are back here, um, and we'll say that this is our I, right? So that's our I point. Uh, maybe we'll call that E, right? Um, and then out here, uh, we know we've got some image plane that we're going to intersect with, and we'll use the forward method, because again, I think this is how it's normally discussed uh, in CG books. Uh, so here is, you know, our monitor, right? And so what we'll do is we'll just call this distance here, right? The distance from the eye to the monitor, uh, we'll just call that D for now, right? The distance between those two. Uh, and then we have out here, we actually have the point that we want to project. And so we're looking for, right, like this, we're looking for this point right here, P prime, okay? And now, as you can see, this is essentially a diagram that works in one axis at a time. So we don't actually care which axis we're solving. We could just, you know, say we'll solve for X or something, whichever one we want to do. We're going to solve the same equation uh, for every axis, X and Y, right? So what do we actually need? Well, we need to know how far uh, this P is uh, from E, right? And that's pretty easy to figure out, right? There's not much we would need to do there. Uh, we know that we have, for example, a measurement axis here. We know that we have, you know, whatever this axis we want uh, to be is. And right now, we're, we've, we've already set it Z, right? We're looking right down 
um, the z axis, although I guess z is coming up, so technically uh, z goes this way, right? Uh, but we know we've already sort of talked about the fact that z in our world goes up and goes up out of the screen. So we already know that this is the z axis. So really, uh, this distance here, right, is just whatever the z coordinate is of this guy, right? Uh, it's it's the camera z minus his z, right? Because the camera z is going to be higher, right? The eyes, I should say the i z. You know what? Maybe I should call this uh, c for camera, camera z. PZ, right? So this distance here is camera uh, Z uh, minus PZ, right? And what you can see if we construct this here is we've actually got similar triangles here, right? These are the same triangle, uh, but for the size, right? Here is a right triangle with the same angle here and the same angle here. And here is another right triangle with the same angle here, same angle here. And what we know from, if you remember way back in your high school geometry or trig classes, I don't even know, I think it's probably geometry classes. If we want, we can always uh, construct a ratio of any sides of similar triangles, right? So if we know that this side of this triangle here is D, and the side of the bigger triangle is CZ minus PZ, right? Then we know we have a ratio uh, that, that would map the other points we need, P prime and P, right? Because we know that P prime uh, to P is gonna be the same as that D value is to the CZ minus PZ, right? That's, that's what we know about these triangles. Uh, so if we multiply out this ratio, right, if we just solve this ratio, we would get P times D, right, or I'll actually do it vector style there, D times P, right? Um, <clears throat> so we'd have D times P, just cross multiply, uh, equaling, again, cross multiply here, CZ minus PZ uh, P prime, right? And what you see here is if P prime is the thing we want to know, then we just have to divide by this to get it, right? So we'd have DP over CZ minus PZ, equals p prime. And that is the perspective projection equation in a nutshell, right there. That's all there is to it. And what you can see right here, and you can understand hopefully now why we were doing it wrong. If you remember when we just threw in that fudge value and I said I want to talk about it later, it's because I wanted to show you all that stuff on the whiteboard. I didn't want to uh, just throw in um, a correct solution and have everyone be like, what are we talking about? Um, if I actually go in here and uh, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, that was in uh, get uh, render entity basis. Uh, you can see that we computed a Z fudge value here and we can computed this Z fudge value based on the Z coordinate. So it seems like it's kind of okay, but then what did we do? We multiplied by it, right? And as you can see, uh, the equation for perspective projection is not a multiplication, it's a division. And that is why we're, we're not having realistic motion uh, in our Z. Remember, take a look at this, right? You can see how that works. It's like some kind of weird stargate effect, right? Which would be nice if what we were constructing was a stargate and be sure to remember that effect should you ever want to construct a stargate. But if we actually want our game to look like it has some 3D perspective going on in it, that is not the way to do it. So let's think about how uh, we would actually do this, right? We want to implement uh, this equation right here. Now, what do we know? Well, P prime is the thing that we want to solve for, right? Uh, and so again, this equation works in both X and Y. So, you know, you can imagine PX, uh, DPX, right? Uh, or equivalently, the exact same equation uh, works uh, in Y, right? Like so. So both equations, uh, exactly the same to solve uh, for each of our uh, variables, right? So what do we want to do here, right? We want to solve for P prime. Well, that's our, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that's our result P. Right, that's the thing that we're trying to solve for, okay? Um, and uh, I guess right here, it's entity ground point is actually the thing that we're projecting. Uh, and so, in fact, what is this even? We, we decided to stop doing this thing. Uh, well, I don't know, that's just where it is. So entity ground point is the thing that we're projecting. And you can see right here that this is the part where we do the projection. We take the entity uh, base PXY and we add the entity base offset XY uh, to essentially produce uh, sort of the unprojected version of the point, right? So this is kind of like the raw XY uh, that we did here, right? Um, that's our raw XY. Uh, but then we just, we multiplied it by this, uh, by this value, okay? Now, the problem with doing that multiplication is what we actually want to do is a division. And so this, this right here, this DPY, 
We know what the PI and the PX are. That's our raw Y and X, right? That's what this is. In fact, I could, uh, I could uh, even call them that if you wanted, although I guess raw X, Y is, is fine for now. That's our raw uh, X and Y. And what we want to do is we want to actually compute this equation, so we need a D value here. So instead of being Z fudge, which is actually based on the Z distance, what we actually need here um, is, is whatever that, that distance is, uh, essentially the, the focal length, right? We need, we need to know, um, oops, we need to know D, right? And remember what D is, is it's the length from the, it's the distance from the camera to the monitor, right? Uh, and so that's what we need to know there. Okay. Again, and this has to be uh, in, in the actual space that we care about. So one thing that's interesting here too is, uh, I guess now that I think about it, um, how is this working exactly? Uh, we did meters to pixels uh, first. I don't know if we really want to do that. We probably want to do all of this in meters uh, actually first, right? Um, and so if you take a look at what's happening here, uh, what we want to do is we want to start getting rid of this stuff. I think we want to uh, save it uh, till the end here. So it's something more like that, if that makes sense. Um, this sort of a thing, right? Uh, so that we're actually doing that, uh, that meters to pixels at the end so we can do everything else in meters. So here we go. Let's go ahead and say uh, we've got distance uh, uh, from camera to monitor, right? Something like that, or, or just distance uh, to monitor, that sort of a thing. And you know how far is a monitor away in reality is probably a totally fine uh, thing to use. I feel like it's probably what, I don't know, maybe about a third of a meter or something like that. I'm not sure how far I am away. I need a, like a ruler here or something like that. Um, but let's say we've got that far to the monitor, right? Um, and then in our world, we then need to know uh, that sort of that Z distance. And in order to compute the Z distance, uh, we know that the z distance is how far away we are, um, right? This this entity base p. Uh, so we, we need our uh, distance uh, to p, or, or I should say, maybe z distance to monitor, something like that. I need to know the distance to the point uh, in z, right? I need this c z minus p z thing. And in order to do that, well, we know what the points z is, right? But we only know it relative to the place we're looking at, right? Because remember, we did all this centered around a camera location we're looking at, which is not actually where the camera is. So if you imagine uh, here is sort of, uh, maybe I'll do it this way. If you imagine here is the world, we were talking about looking at this point. But that means the camera is actually somewhere up here pointing down at it, right? So we also have another value, which is essentially how far away is the camera from what it's looking at, right? Um, and so we have another one, which is basically like a distance above ground or camera distance above ground, right? And so who knows how far the camera is above ground? That's something we can tune to taste, uh, but maybe it's, you know, I don't know how, how big we want it to be. It's, it's uh, you know, 10 meters above the ground for now. And we can basically play with these values. These are purely arbitrary values, obviously, for framing the shot um, <clears throat> and setting the, the lens type, right? They, they don't matter at all. We can pick them to be whatever, whatever looks good. Uh, we know we will still get something that behaves similar to a camera. Uh, and so that distance to PZ, right, uh, is going to be whatever the entity base, uh, base uh, PZ was, right? Uh, and remember, that's going to be, um, if that number is positive, right, it's actually going to be closer to us because Z comes upwards. And if it's negative, it's going away. So we actually want to subtract uh, the Z value uh, from the distance to monitor because as it gets negative, it gets, I mean, uh, sorry, from the camera distance above ground, uh, because it actually, uh, as, as it gets negative, it's getting further away from us, right? So we wanna make uh, this value get larger uh, at that time. So then we get our distance to PZ. We now have uh, essentially everything uh, that we need, right? To compute that equation, okay? So let's go ahead and compute the equation. Uh, let me go back and, and uh, scroll to it. There it is. Uh, so we want dPy, right? And so we know what the py, uh, p, the pxpy is, right? We know that those are entity base p, oh, sorry. Uh, we know that th there they are right there. Uh, we know that they are raw xy. That's the, that's the actual value. So we want our distance um, uh, to the monitor times that, right? 
And then we want to divide that um, by uh, that sort of uh, denominator. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it denominator, and that, that will compute our, our result, right? Uh, so this is our, our new, um, uh, what should I call this? Uh, I guess we'll call this projected xy, right? So there's projected xy. Uh, so I don't want to just do the divide by the denominator because what we have to do here first is verify that that denominator uh, will actually be uh, positive, right? We do, or I shouldn't even say positive. We want to make sure that it's uh, not going to be a divide by zero, right? So we have to pick some uh, cutoff uh, there so that when things get super close to the camera, uh, we will no longer draw them. Otherwise, they would potentially be directly on the camera or something. That'd be like if you passed through the lens of the camera and got back into the camera itself or something like that, right? Um, so what we need to do is compute that denominator. The denominator, again, is the camera Z, right, minus um, the point Z. Uh, and so that's what we've already computed here, right? That distance to PZ total, right? That's the total distance out to it. Uh, so we've got that, right? Uh, so all we need to do with our denominator is check to see uh, whether that's going to be, you know, big enough that we consider it far enough away. And that's, that's a, what we normally call the near clip plane, right? I don't know if you've ever heard uh, near clip plane before, but the near clip plane, right, is the thing that says, well, you know, if I take a look at these, the similar triangles, right? In fact, I'll just go up here to this, right? At some point, when something moves far enough back here, uh, that it would actually be, you know, behind me. Obviously, I don't want to render it. So that would be, you know, a near clip plane of zero. But if it was right on zero, I would have a divide by zero. So that's not good either. So I pick some arbitrary point out here to sort of say, we're only, we're only well conditioned past this value, let's say 0 0.2 or something. So we're only going to consider things that are at least that far away. Uh, so we want to make sure that the distance to PZ is greater than uh, whatever that near clip plane is, and then we can do our projected XY, right? Uh, like so. Uh, and what we'll do there is we'll just say, well, okay, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> we'll set the, the, uh, the, I'm trying to think of like what we, we just shouldn't draw the thing here. So I think we probably need to say that it's clipped. Like we're gonna have to return something here that basically says don't draw this, right? We need to do like something like that, if that makes sense. Um, and so, you know, we want to do something like uh, like this, right? Else, uh, well, you know what I can do? I can just say it's nothing, right? So there we go. Uh, and so result dot valid equals true. There we go. Uh, and let's take a look here. Uh, oh yeah, I'll just do. We don't actually support a divide at the moment, so I'll do one over that. There we go. So, uh, our focal length, oh, I named it the wrong thing. Uh, so, there we go, sorry about that. <laughs> Got a little overzealous with the naming. Uh, so there we go. Uh, focal length uh, comes in both places, is that correct? That doesn't look right. I think I, while I was busy talking, I think I, I made a mistake there. D should only show up once, right? So what did we get here? We got one over the distance times uh, the, uh, the focal length uh, times the raw. That's correct. So why was the focal length used before or used again? Focal length times, oh, because I started to type it in here. Yeah, I don't know why I did that. That was just me being, being my typo self. So there's our projected xy. Uh, we've got it. Uh, and so we can go ahead and also, uh, you know, I guess we can do it that way so it's a little cleaner. Uh, I think that's basically all we need. Uh, the scale value, um, I guess, would just be uh, if we were going to say, so that was actually to project other points. So if we were going to take something that was one unit long and project it, uh, that's what we would want to return, return for our scale, right? Because we want to say how things are scaling with Z. Uh, so if we want to say how things are scaling with Z, um, I guess what we would probably want to return, I got to think about whether that's correct. Normally what we do is we'd project all four points, um, but I guess what we can do instead is just project the unit distance, right? Take one, right? And say, well, if we were going to project uh, one at this same distance, uh, what would it give us? Right? And so what I can do is say, well, um, let's do a three, let's do three projections, make raw XY, 
uh, actually be sort of raw x, y, z, uh, and actually do it this way, right? Pass in a one value there, so now I see how one will scale, and that's the scale value uh, projected uh, x, y actually has like a secret z component that tells us how it scales, right? Um, and then to actually do this, obviously I don't want that z value in there when it's actually being used. Uh, okay, uh, so now we assuredly have some things we've got to uh, fix. Uh, but of course, actually already, even though we're kind of super janky here, you can actually see that the scaling, at least now, uh, does actually work uh, more correctly. But that's sort of a separate, uh, that's sort of a separate issue. So first off, let me, um, let me just uh, uh, set these values a little bit more here. It looks like we're off center a little. I don't understand why that would be, uh, but uh, let me see. Uh, it looks like we're just not centered, but our, our transform is looking actually correct. Uh, but it just doesn't look like we're, uh, we're centered quite yet. All right, so let's double check everything here. Because uh, everything should be based around the screen center, uh, which it is. Uh, and because all of the values that come in are just based around the screen center. Uh, and so when we're adding these together, right, that's just, uh, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and, and just take this out here. I don't, that was for our Y displacement, I guess was where that was happening. Uh, so I don't know if we want to keep doing that wise. I'm just going to put this in here for now to simplify things out a little bit. OK, uh, so we have our distance values. We have our focal length. We have our raw xy. We have our entity base p's and the offsets uh, to those base p's. And that all kind of looks roughly correct to me. I'm not sure why we seem to be scaling out of the wrong place, because I feel like all these values uh, should have been properly centered uh, around the X and Y. So I'm not sure why we're getting, you can see that we're kind of, uh, everything seems to actually be down from where the camera is, uh, and I don't understand why that is, right? Everything seems to uh, be offset massively uh, before the actual scaling takes place, before we do this, right? Uh, it's as if everything is, is very sort of shifted, uh, and I'm not sure exactly uh, why that is it might be something I'm forgetting about how we're passing in our values. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> uh, it looks like everything else about it is correct, though. So taking a look at this, um, I want to kind of know if the entity base P's here, these should all be centered around zero, correct? So let me see. I want to make sure that that is actually true. Uh, so when we push a, a bitmap on here, Right? Um, ah, meters to pixels minus, ah, so that's our problem, right? We haven't quite gotten it down to the point uh, where things are all actually happening in meters, right? Our offset is still uh, happening in pixels here. Uh, and that bitmap alignment, hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, uh, you know, that's not a problem per se. I just don't know if I want to leave that hanging around, right? Um, I just don't know if I like that. It seems to me, uh, you know, like I just wonder if that's just going to keep causing problems because everything uh, should maybe be done, in, meters to pixels should maybe be done later on in the pipeline, right? Hmm. Hmm. So what the reason not to do that is it would force us to store the alignment until later. And that doesn't sound fabulous. So taking it into meters to pixels actually does seem like the right idea. The problem is all the rest of this stuff then has to be done in pixels, right? Um, which is actually fine. It's just uh, kind of crazy, right? Um, but okay, so if you think about it, if the offset comes in uh, as pixels, right, uh, then, you know, now that would translate this into a, a, a pixel value, right? Um, and in theory, I guess, since the focal length uh, and the distance to PZ are essentially going to divide out, I suppose it would still work, even just having them not be, you know, being in, near, in meters to pixels. So I guess technically we could leave it that way. Um, I'm just not sure 
uh, that's such a good idea, but we can actually do that. Now, if that was the case and we were actually doing uh, meters to pixels, um, then we need that the camera distance above ground, uh, again, to also be uh, in meters to pixels as well, um, <clears throat> which is kind of crazy. Uh, but let's make sure this is all, so camera distance above ground minus entity base PZ. I lied, it's actually this quantity it has to be, right? And you can see this is kind of messy uh, and I don't love it, uh, but you can kind of see already in there, uh, we're starting to get it uh, back to the right uh, centering. Uh, so yeah, okay, so meters to pixels. This is, this is super janky. I, it's one of those things where I feel like it's so much nicer to write it just doing everything in meters and saving the bitmap alignment to the end, but at the same time, if we're going to try to go for efficiency in the render, you probably want to smack all that stuff down to begin with. So I guess we should just keep going this way and then we'll try to condense everything down into something that properly, that, that just makes it so it's not too big of a deal uh, that that's happening, right? <clears throat> all right. Um, so then I guess we would also need uh, this focal length to be in meters to pixels. Kind of crazy, uh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and then I think we're getting there. Uh, we're starting to get there. Uh, I want to move the camera uh, back a bit here. So now you can sort of start to see that stuff is actually moving properly, though. Uh, like for example, uh, you can kind of see that uh, <clears throat> as I move around here. Uh, the things in the background sort of look like they're more obeying a, a proper perspective rule. Uh, so we're very close now. We just have to go through the math one more time now that uh, we're, we actually have to deal with the, the meters pixel thing and make sure that we have everything uh, actually correct. I'm also going to restart here because I don't remember what we went down or up in terms of, oops, in terms of um, uh, things here. So there's the actual starting uh, setup of it. Uh, and I feel like we also have a, there's some kind of a weirdness here. Uh, with um, with the stairwell, <laughs> wow! So you can see how dramatic that scaling is. There we go. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so let's go ahead. I want to see what happens. Also, I just want to see what happens if I change this value. Just playing around with it here. Yeah. So so we just have a we just have a few more scale things to work out. Um, we've basically we've basically got everything essentially correct. Uh, we just got to go through and rework things out to make sure our middle to pixels are right. Uh, but we're, we're pretty much good to go now. Um, so I think we're going to be fine. Like so, yeah. Our rectangles are currently the wrong size, though, I believe, because I think we need to actually make sure that we properly handle uh, their sizes. I don't know that we're properly handling the size of them back in the, um, in the, the call uh, that we were in the rectangle drawing call. But yeah. All right, so let's work through this math one more time, now knowing uh, that we have meters to pixels to contend with. So what's basically happening is uh, this stuff is getting smacked down into meters to, to pixels uh, when we actually make the push bitmap call, right? So got the push bitmap call. Uh, we now know that entity basis offset is in meters to pixels, right? <clears throat> or I should say is in pixels. So. Uh, what that means is that when we call entity, when we take entity basis P, it's not in meters to pixels. Uh, so I guess I'm just going to say the first thing we'll do, let's change uh, entity basis basis P uh, to meters to pixels so that it's in meters to pixels. Uh, we want the focal length in meters to pixels. We want the camera distance above ground in meters, I mean in pixels. Everything's going to be in pixels. Um, and so then when we do this computation, now this computation is just done in pixels. And that's fine. The near clip plane is also in pixels, and that's fine. We can get rid of the Z fudge value because that's gone now, right? Uh, and uh, and then when we actually do this entity base PXY, this offset XY is already in pixels. It's the reason we had to do all this, uh, so we can actually do this math properly. Uh, we then do our divide out with our raw XY and our screen center, all that goodness. And I think that's about right. I'm going to change this back to the value we originally had it at, also, like so. Um, did I stop the game running? I did stop the game from running. Uh, and so I think that's mostly all we need to do to make sure our scale is correct. 
Uh, and then what we want to do is figure out how far above uh, everything the camera should be, which is again kind of a, an arbitrary value. I don't know what this should actually be. I have to think about uh, what that actually is. Obviously, if we were to pull it down, uh, camera just above ground, I wonder what happens if we just set that uh, to zero. Uh, that's interesting. Kind of, I'm interested to know what, what is happening here. Um, it seems like we're getting a lot more elongation uh, than we should have, right? Um, so I feel like there's still something, uh, something odd going on there. Right, and I don't know exactly what it is because I feel like this is correct. Uh, the focal length should not really be uh, too far off from that, I would think. Right. Uh, I wonder if this is a nonlinearity problem as well. Uh, I don't see why. If all that stuff's in pixels, it should still just work. I feel like this is should be scale invariant. Right. I have to think about that a little bit more. Um, the camera distance above ground, 0 0.5. Uh, so really this should be able to be higher though, right? I mean the camera should be able to be a few meters above the ground uh, and still work properly. So that's a bit odd, right? Um, so I want to leave that as that and, and figure out what exactly is going wrong because we've still got something a little bit weird. It should not be that small is I guess uh, the way I would look at it. Uh, although the fact that it's in pixels is kind of weird. It's kind of weird. I feel like maybe there is a hidden scale thing that happens there, but I don't know. So anyway, uh, the raw XY entity base PXY, we're saying, right? And this is correct, right? We've got the inverse of the distance to PZ, camera distance above ground, uh, and then as the Z values get more negative, it gets further away, which is exactly what we expect to see. Um, and the distance to it is always gonna be roughly that, which is what we expect. Um, so yeah, I don't see, I don't see what the problem is there. Um, and it really does seem like the focal length wants to be set a lot higher, but I just don't understand why that would be, uh, right? Like if we were to set this focal length higher, um, then everything looks fine, right? Uh, you know, the game looks as we intended it uh, with, a, with a, you know, the other focal length. Um, but I'm not sure I know. Not sure I know why that would be. Um, normally there's a step where you turn uh, you know, world units into pixels, and of course, uh, we've already are doing it in pixels. So maybe I'm just, maybe the focal length actually gets multiplied in there uh, in some way that I don't understand. So I'm going to have to uh, actually uh, see about that certainly. Um, but you can basically see that by changing these two values, we can get the effect we want. So there's actually nothing practically wrong at the moment with the math, like it it works fine in terms of getting the effect that we want and the effect is correct. You can see that now uh, it actually works uh, properly, right? Uh, to give us uh, the parallax that we wanted and we can use those two values to control uh, just how much of that we want. But the thing is, I just don't think that's what the value should be, right? Uh, and so I feel like what's happening is the fact that we're not doing it in meters actually introduces some kind of a nonlinear effect with the pixel values that is why I have to make those values larger. And so I have to think about, I wanna know why that is, it, that'll, that's gonna bother me. So I suspect that we will probably, even though technically we've done what we need to do, um, I feel like I really want to go find out why that is, right? Uh, but yeah, so everything seems to be working properly now. Uh, and we can get exactly the effect that we wanted. It's just that um, I'm just not comfortable with how that worked out is all, right? I'm gonna jump, jump. 
I can actually jump up into the sky. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I think that's probably all I want to do right now because I don't know that I want to go. I, I want people to be able to ask questions that are not necessarily related to that. Um, so I guess I'll just say here uh, to do these. Uh, the values of 20 and 20 seem wrong. Did I mess something up here? Uh, and, you know, let me, real quick before we start the Q&A, let me just do the math one more time to make sure that I actually didn't screw it up. Um, because, you know, like I said, I haven't actually, I guess, made a Killeth Master on the stream yet, which is unusual. Um, this could be the first one, right? It could be that I just did it uh, totally wrong or something, right? Which would not be unlike me. Um, that's what normally happens in my real life. Like, it actually looks like I'm better at math on the stream than I actually am, uh, because probably because I'm covering things that are maybe, uh, that I, you know, know pretty well. Um, when I'm actually working out new math stuff, it's atrocious. Like, I just, it's a disaster zone all the time, um, you know? So anyway, uh, Let's say this is uh, the, the monitor. So here is, you know, uh, the I point, and here is uh, P prime. I'm sorry, here is P, uh, here is P prime. Uh, and so we'll call this X. Uh, we will call uh, this distance uh, D again. Uh, and we will call this, this long distance, um, we will call that, uh, Oh, I did do it wrong. I totally did do it wrong. I drew the diagram wrong. If this is the camera point, right, uh, then this is just, uh, that's, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I shouldn't say I did it wrong, but you didn't quite do it as I probably should have, right? Uh, if this is the Z distance from, we could just say this is the distance uh, from the camera, right, uh, to to here. Um, yeah, this is going to come out to the same thing. Uh, so never mind. I guess I didn't do it wrong. Well, I'm going to keep going anyway. But anyway, if this is the, the z-coordinate that is the total distance, right, uh, then I know that my ratio is just going to be px to pz uh, is equal to uh, px prime to d, right? Uh, so multiplying that out, it's pz px prime uh, equals px uh, d, right? And so solving for this, I want uh, px d uh, over pz, right? Um, at least that seems seems like it to me, right? Uh, and so yeah, so basically like. That's what we're talking about here. Um, that's the entirety of solving that equation. I don't see anything else going on there, really. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And if I take a look at what we're actually doing here, right? Um, you've got one over distance to PZ which is what that is, times focal length times rho x, so that's exactly right. The distance to the PZ is just however far the camera is above the ground uh, level, um, or I should say target perhaps is a better word, right? Uh, minus whatever that, that base Z uh, value is, right? Uh, and that seems like that's correct because our Z value is going this way, so we want that to get uh, more negative. So that, that I don't know. That really just seems right. Yeah. All right. So let's go to the Q&A. Uh, let's see here. Work. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the Q&A. Oops. Is 
is squinting analogous to closing a camera's aperture? So I don't think so. Um, I think squinting is probably more similar to changing the focus and uh, putting on one of those hood things. Um, changing a camera's aperture is more like your iris contracting. Like when you go out in the sun and your iris contracts, that's like the aperture. I'm sorry, not your iris, uh, your pupil. You know the little black dot, it, it contracts? That's, that's like what that's doing. That's, that's contracting the, the aperture, right? Are you intending to multiply by x, y, z and not just the x, y as the variable says? Uh, yeah, so the reason we want to do all three is because we want to know what one would project to as well so that we can use it as our scale value, right? So that's why I do the z as well. Uh, again, it's just doing the exact same equation on all three variables, so we're just getting all three at once, that's all. Wasn't the room height eight meters? Really? Did we set the room height to be eight meters? Uh, if that's the case, that's just totally stupid, and that may be it. You, you may have nailed it. Let me see here. Um, typical room, typical floor height. No, the floor height looks like it's about right, right? Because that's about a 10 foot floor, which is about right. Expect a ton of pre stream questions. Uh oh. What happened? Were we on the front page or something? Wasn't the parameter already converted to pixels? If so, then I think you are converting to meter, converting meters to pixels twice. I don't think so because, so entity base P uh, has not been converted to pixels, right? Uh, so that's, entity base P needs to be converted to pixels. The thing that was converted to pixels was entity offset. Right? And that's why we can't do the things in meters, because it was already done in meters to pixels. We could have multiplied by the inverse here and then done everything in meters, right? Um, and then projected out, right? And that would have been fine. Uh, in fact, we can try that and see if it's the same. Uh, I feel like it, it, well, I mean, I guess we kind of know that it would be the same, so I don't really need to do that, but. If you wanted to use this code to make a full 3D game such as a first person shooter, how much would you have to change to give the player an adjustable FOV option? Uh, well, so um, we can actually cover that since this, we kind of need to debug this. Uh, so maybe Monday what we'll do is we'll cover that uh, because really what you're doing here is the, the focal length uh, is essentially what tells you what the FOV is, right? That's what that does. Uh, and so really uh, you can solve for what the focal length is. Uh, trying to try to give you what the idea is here. Um, so this is the value that we're using, right? Uh, that's the value that we're using to control uh, the projection, right? And what FOV is, is it's this angle, right? Uh, this angle, uh, <clears throat> I mean, let me draw a new diagram. Need new diagram. There we go. Uh, so let's say this is the top of the screen. So that's this is how big the screen is, right? Uh, so this is top of the screen. This is bottom of the screen. OK? Uh, and here's the eye. Okay, so here we go. Uh, when we're doing these projecting points, so here's you know um, our p prime or whatever, and p's out here somewhere, right? Uh, what you're talking about when you talk about FOV, right? FOV means field of view, and what that is is that's an angle, right? 
So if I say I've got 90 degree FOV, what I'm talking about is that the maximum angle of a point that could be projected is gonna be um, uh, 45, right? Because if it's 90, it's half this way, half that way. They're talking about the total angle, like uh, between the top and the bottom, right? Uh, so that total angle, that's your FOV. So what that tells you is, well, if you just, if you've got this, you know how far away the screen is, right? Um, I'm sorry, <clears throat> you know how big the screen actually is, right? Uh, and so if you wanna know what this length is, uh, all you need to know uh, to, to uh, figure that out is to use this, this size plus this angle, and you know you have a right triangle, you can use uh, the tangent, right, um, to compute what the D value would be for a particular FOV. So the answer is, you actually don't do anything uh, to this code to make it support programmable FOV. All you do is you stick a tangent uh, computation onto the front uh, to basically compute D from knowing uh, an angle uh, and, uh, and a height, right? That's, that's, that's it. So it's the same code, it's just, uh, it's just computing it. So it says expect a lot of pre-stream questions, but I don't really see that many questions on there. Um, so that's good. How long do you think this is going to take? Uh, my estimate was 600 hours, um, which, right, like, so I feel like that's a fair estimate. Um, so, uh, right, if 600 hours and you figure a work week is 40 hours or so, right? Uh, then I figure if you divide this out uh, so that we're just saying how many, like, I'm going to say work weeks, right? Uh, how many work weeks do we have here, right? It's, it's roughly like 15 or something, right? Um, so we're talking about like a 15, imagine if you were going to program uh, 15 weeks of programming is roughly what we're aiming to get the game done in, which is actually incredibly short, right? It's incredibly, incredibly short. It's much shorter than most people take even to make a game with an engine. Um, but, you know, since we have to do it, we do only an hour a night, and this, would or this is already two years here, even an incredibly short game, if we actually stream all of the programming, which is what we're doing, uh, just takes a really long time to get through. Nothing you can really do about that. Sonic Fee, no OpenGL, no audio library, no anything. How is being a masochist coming along? Uh, so it was all really simple, right? I mean, we already have the unoptimized version of the renderer and we have audio playing. Um, so that turned out to be nothing. I mean, we'll, we'll take a couple weeks maybe. Uh, so, you know, maybe something like, I want to say like 24 hours or something of time to optimize the renderer. But if that's what you call being a masochist, I mean, literally like we've only programmed for 100 hours, right, so far. And a lot of that's explanation time. So if you actually want to talk about how long it would actually take me to write those things, like redoing OpenGL is, is trivial. It's like a week's worth of work or something, right? Um, it, it's just a, it's, it's a no-brainer. An audio library, audio is so simple. You can write an audio library in a day, right? It's, it's totally trivial. Uh, we take a long time on the stream because uh, we tackle a bunch of random stuff that we, um, that I kind of want to go, that, that's like a trade-off based, like handling Z. Like we could have just not handled Z and that would have saved probably like literally 50 hours of time or something. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, like it, it really just doesn't take very long at all. Uh, because we do ex explanations and because we only do an hour a night, it seems like it takes a long time, but if you actually map that into how long it would take you if you just sat down and coded, it's like nothing. Um, so yeah, I mean, how long did it take us to do a texture map triangle? One hour? and 40 minutes of it was explanation. So it took 20 minutes to program a texture mapper. <laughs> That's how long it took us. So masochist, no. I mean, if it's taking you longer than that to, to do the programming, you should come watch the stream and not call people masochists because you've got something to learn. Hello, 
as a software developer, I understand the performance benefits of C++ are important. However, there are a lot of REPL-based code at runtime tools coming out that streamline development on both the web and in games. How do you feel about this departure from traditional software development tools? Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not sure what REPL stands for in this case, code at runtime tools. Are you talking about things that just try to compile, like jitting? What do you mean? Tell me what you mean. R E P L code tools. Read eval print loop. Uh, so you're just talking about the fact that you can run code that you type in? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Here's what I will say. Um, so if you think that for some reason C++ means that you can't interactively code, uh, maybe you're new to the stream. Um, but here's the game running, right? Um, and here's my code, right? Um, if I wanted to do something like change the projection equation, I can just do that and it updates in the game live. Right? So you don't need some crazy web language that runs super slowly and makes all of your code lousy to get real time coding. You just have to code the code. You have to write the code properly to, to do that in C, which I think took us three hours of total stream time to do. So it's extremely simple to do that in C. It takes hardly any time at all. Um, and there's like one or two things you can't do if you do that, but there are things. Uh, specific C things you can't do once you do it that way if you want the uh, incremental stuff to work. But for most, for you know, 90% of the tweaks you do, it's it just works. Do you use iPhone? If it's yes, I would like to give you a copy of my game for iOS. Um, Thank you very much for the offer, but no, I, I do not have an iPhone. Um, sorry. Will this game have cinematic mode? Well, it will have some cinematics. It'll have a cutscene. It'll have an intro cutscene. Don't want to give too much away, but it will. I don't see any more questions. Are we done? Is that it? Kappa? Everything just has a kappa on the end of it, apparently. And I feel like uh, if Jonathan Blow wants to flame about the iPhone, Jonathan Blow can flame about the iPhone. I feel like he is well within uh, his rights to do so because they're pretty darn annoying devices. Uh, would the renderer be able to support something like zooming out for one screen that is twice as large as normal? Sure, we can support any kind of zooming that we want. If we wanted to support uh, smooth zooming down uh, to really tiny sizes, like uh, so right now, uh, I guess you can't really see it here, but you could sort of, you sort of saw it before when we were doing the test uh, and we had this number a lot smaller. So when we were down, um, here, let's say, oops, that's not what I meant. Uh, so when we were down here, right, uh, I don't know if you can see, maybe if I turn off those blue lines, you could see it a little bit better. Uh, let me go in here and, uh, and turn off those, uh, those boundary lines. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and just turn those off, right? Uh, so if you turn off those boundary lines, uh, I don't know if you can see this, because it's not, I guess, it's probably not, ooh, I don't want to know what I just hit. I hit something that Windows is thinking about. Please don't do something crazy, Windows. No, what, what the hell was that? Why did it do that? I don't want a media center experience. I don't even know what that was. That is unacceptable. Anyway, 
Uh, what I was trying to show you is if you take a look at um, at this when when things are shrunk down, do you see how you get some like kind of sparkly artif like it, it it doesn't look smooth, right? Like if you just look at the pixels in the in there, it kind of looks a little sparkly and janky at the edges, right? Uh, where whereas if I um, if I go back to sort of the normal size, uh, you can you can sort of see uh, there isn't that, right? It's 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 nice and smooth everywhere. The reason is because once you scale down to a certain size, we're only doing bilinear filtering, which means once you scale below half size, so anything from half size down, uh, third size, quarter size, and so on, you'll get sparklies because you're no longer sampling all of the pixels uh, that are involved. You're no longer sampling all the colors that are involved. And so you get this, um, we kind of talked about this sampling a little bit. And that's where you need bit mapping, uh, which we didn't implement because we don't actually ever need it for the actual game. And so it would just slow us down. Uh, but if you wanted to scale things down really smoothly to very tiny sizes, so let's say you go to something twice the size of the screen, down to the size of the screen, down to half the size of the screen, so the total scaling size uh, was like a quarter of its size, we would want to implement, implement MIP mapping for that. Um, but we don't really have any need for that, I don't think, in the game, and so that's not necessary. Pseudonym73, lots of quick time events too. Uh, yeah, I don't know about quick time events. Probably not quick time events, but yeah. Where about is the explanation of the reloading the code while running? It sounds like fun. Um, so that is if you go to um, uh, the forum site, right? Uh, this, this thing here. If you go, so this is handmadehero.org. If you go to the forum site, uh, you can actually go to this episode guide thing and it's got like a lot of stuff on there and this week five fun with win 32 uh, Basically shows you a bunch of stuff uh, And we've got all kinds of fancy stuff in there. I don't even we haven't used this because we're not working on animation Right now we've used it like once or twice. I think but we haven't used it too much uh, But one of the things that we also did is we actually have looped live code editing which is even cooler than live code editing um, so, you know, if you do something like um, where I, you know, I go down the stairwell or something, right? And then I come over here and, and I don't know, go down it again, right? Um, like so, uh, I can just set that as like a loop, right? Um, and then it'll just play while I edit the game, right? So I don't even have to go up there and do input, right? It's just, uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Like basically, like anyone who doesn't do this should do this. It's way better than even developing in like other languages that are supposed to be easier this like, um, you know, it, it's, it gives you all the benefits of optimized code, but you also have complete freedom to modify the code um, uh, while running. And there's a couple, like I said, you can't change structure layouts if you do it the way we did it on stream, because we did it in the simplest way you can do it. You need more advanced stuff if you want to be able to train structure layouts on the fly. But that's not that often, and all you have to do is just restart you know, just uh, just on those, and that's not a big deal. So even the simple one that we did on the stream is is pretty darn powerful at the end of the day, you know. So. Uh. What kind of game is this going to be, and what will the point of it be? Uh, it's just a it's a it's just a Zelda type game where you kind of adventure around in a forest, uh, and the emphasis is on programming. So we're trying to make sure that it has lots of complex programming things in it, uh, meaning like multiple Z levels and scaling between them and walking between them and you know all kinds of stuff and, and crazy interactions between stuff like uh, very complex object systems and stuff like that. We're focusing on that sort of thing if that makes sense because we want the programming to be uh, sort of difficult to cover and stuff like that. And we write the renderer and all that sort of stuff. It's not running OpenGL. This is our own renderer that we wrote. Which we're not done yet. That's what we're in the middle of doing. Um, when the game is finished, do you expect the game to look as good as if you made it in a commercial engine? Uh, I actually ex expect the game to look way better than it look than it would look in a commercial engine, um, and the reason that I say that is because the graphics will basically be the same because we'll call OpenGL just like 
everyone else for our hardware acceleration path, so it'll be basically the same. Um, but I feel like we'll just have a bunch of stuff that, you know, game engines really are very lousy at nowadays. Like, you know, I when I load up games like a game in Unity or something, I'm often staring at somebody's loading screen or, or the world, you know, has to pause when it loads and it goes from level to level or stuff like that. And we will not have any of that stuff um, because we'll be doing our stuff properly. And so, you know, I, I'm... I don't suspect that this this game will be just at parity with an engine. I suspect it will actually be better in a number of ways than an engine. And we already are way better than any engine that I know of right now in terms of scale, uh, because we actually support extraordinarily large worlds already. Um, we already did the work to like handle that. And so assuming that we maintain that, I think we'll be pretty good as well. I also suspect our object system will be much better than any one that's in, uh, available in commercial engines. So yeah, so I don't intend this to be, like I said, this is not a toy project. This should be significantly better than anything you can buy off the shelf. Um, the only thing we might not do is uh, like go nuts on effects. So, you know, a commercial engine might have had better effects, like special effects stuff, because we probably won't spend time on some of that stuff. Um, that'd be the only thing. But, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll even decide to do that at some point. But that, that wasn't really, I don't think that's super interesting because that's just kind of like GPU uh, sort of flailing. Can I learn how to be a better programmer from this channel? I hope so, that's the goal anyway. Um, or at least a better game programmer. Uh, I don't really talk about any other kind of programming on the stream because I'm a game programmer. So uh, I don't know if, if it would help programming in general, but hopefully it would, it would be good for game programmers. Are you planning any DLC for this game? Um, actually, kind of yes. And the only reason for that is actually because um, since the entirety of the game development is streamed, uh, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, I've been trying to figure out how to still have there be surprises in it that people don't know about. And so one way that I was considering doing that was uh, basically like release, you know, we do all the work up to shipping the game so that everyone, you know, could see that on stream, which was the goal. But then, you know, maybe I do a DLC pack that is not streamed and so, people can download that and and uh, have surprises in there for things that they didn't know were in the game, right, until they find them. So, so maybe, uh, but it's not a concrete plan, you know. Do you use Windows Media Center a lot in your game development process? Yes, that is why it's so good that Microsoft made a hotkey uh, that I don't even know what it was to get to Media Center because what if you're right in the middle of coding and you really need it to be like right now? You don't want it to slow you down, right? You don't want to like, it's like having slow compile times, right? If it takes you a long time to open up Windows Media Center, that's really going to drag on your productivity. So good job, Microsoft, um, getting that hotkey in there because I'm sure that if someone had to go to the start menu and pick Windows Media Center, there would just be no way they'd ever get anything done. <clears throat> Manic the Nobody, why does he move slower at higher zoom? Uh, so the reason is because we have not optimized our renderer yet. And so actually, although it is running uh, sort of at, you know, I don't know, 15 frames a second or something, because holy cow, computers are fast. Um, once we're using actually an extraordinarily slow uh, rectangle filling routine, because optimizing it is something that we uh, want to start maybe in a week or so. And so the closer you are to stuff, the more pixels they're filling on screen, so the slower it runs. Uh, once we go ahead and optimize that, this will all probably run just fine, uh, and you won't see any of that. Uh, but until we actually do that work of doing the optimization, it will, it will uh, run slowly when, when things are covering a lot of the screen. Because the cost, I guess the thing I'm not implicitly saying, the cost is based on how many pixels you draw. And right now we're probably a hundred times slower or something. Well, not a hundred times slower. We're probably like 20 times slower than we should be or something heinous like that. Uh, and so every pixel takes 20 times longer to process than it should. So if you have less pixels, it's drastically less time. Hence, bigger things slower, smaller things quicker.
Will the game be fun? Well, I don't know. I'll try to make it fun, but I'm not a game designer, so I can't promise that. I can promise it will be well programmed, um, but I can't really promise it'll be fun. Will you cover things like patching and downloading code from the internet? Uh, probably not. Um, I don't think we're going to cover networking on the stream. So we just, you know, we just let Steam handle that, I think is how we would mostly be doing that. So looks like we are at the end. Um, are you planning on implementing some kind of shader support? Oh man, you know we've got it, right? You, we just, I mean, but you just write it in C, so, but we've, uh, we already did some fairly complex stuff, which we haven't, uh, uh, we haven't quite put to use yet because we wanted to go get all of our Z and other assorted things straightened out first. Um, but basically, yeah, uh, we, um, where is it here? Coordinate system, coordinate system, there it is. Uh, we already did a bunch of shader stuff in preparation for our lighting, right? Um, so you can kind of see that sphere there is, is using reflection, uh, some reflection stuff that we were testing with these reflection maps, right? Um, so yeah. All right. Will this game have a collector's edition? I want a plastic drag it in it for $150. Um, Ninjin, does that mean carrot in Japanese? Um, anyway, uh, I feel like for $150, I don't know if that gets you a plastic dragon. It might get you a cloth map, um, but if you want the plastic dragon, that may be only for the $250 pre-order uh, that's through GameStop. Um, and But before you balk at the $250 price tag, remember you will also get a special uh, golden prosthetic limb for your limbless child in game that only people who do the $250 pre-order uh, get. So it's not just the plastic dragon in the collector's edition in the pre-order special. It's also that, that special in-game uh, uh, golden, golden prosthetic. So, so you know, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to pass up. Get those $250 fat cash wads ready. Um, <clears throat> all right, I gotta close down the stream now. I gotta go, guys, it's dinner time. Um, <clears throat> I'm kidding, of course, about there's not going to be a pre-order special. Uh, I, I, am, I am not that kind of a developer. Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, let me close this down. I guess it's doing its little looping there. Let's close this down. Thank you, everyone, once again for joining me for Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as it always is. I hope to see you back here Monday. I believe it'll also be 5 p.m. on Twitch. That seems to be a good time slot for us. I think we're gonna stay there. It's, it's easier for me to work into my work day if we do it that way, so that's when I tend to do it. Um, as always, if you would like to follow along at home, you can pre-order the game at any time and it comes with the source code every night. I update the source code after we finish here. So if you wanna play around with the source code yourself, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, just go to handmadehero.org and hit that pre-order button and uh, off you go. If you want to support the video series, we also have a Patreon page, which is much appreciated. If you want to be a supporter, that's awesome. Uh, we also have a tweet bot that tweets the schedule at you. So if you want to know when the stream is going to be live, uh, check that out. It's pretty handy. It'll tell you the schedule every weekend. It tweets out the full schedule for the week. And then on weekdays, it gives you like kind of a warning, like today's stream is going to be at such and such a time. And then finally, there's a forum site, uh, which is a great resource if you're trying to learn from the stream. There's a, a forum you can ask questions. There's also an annotated episode guide, which you saw on today's stream, in fact, me pointing out. Uh, and also there's ports to like Mac and Linux and stuff, which you know we're gonna do on stream, but if you wanna follow along uh, today on Mac and Linux before we get to those ports, uh, people in the community have already done uh, them for you. So you can just kind of go uh, look at that, which is kind of awesome. So that's it. Thanks everyone for joining me. I hope to see you back here on Monday. Have an excellent weekend, and until then, take it easy.